when I was at college, one of my tutors said, if you're going to preach, you always need to take control of the space so that you have it as you want it. And if you could turn the mic down a bit, that would be really good. So, <clears throat> it's really good to be here. Earlier on this afternoon, we weren't sure we were going to make it because it's snowing in London. And it was quite slippy getting out of college. And the snow just kind of continued to go until we got to the M25 when it kind of went into sleet and then into rain and then into spray and then it was dry. Um, so it's good to be here. Um, Canterbury Baptist has always been kind of on the radar um, from, from Bob and Mary. Um, the whole Spurgeon's thing, and uh, at then yeah, Debbie and Perry kind of coming to, to, to live in Canterbury and having worshipped here too, and uh, then with the, the ministers in training you've had, because you've sent us some good ministers in training, so it's, it really is good to be here. So, first love. Years and years and years ago, and I hadn't long been a preacher. And I'd, I'd been preaching in, in the book of Revelation. And there is that uh, message of Jesus to the church at Ephesus about returning to your first love. And I was quite young, because I started preaching when I was 16. And I'd taken this as a kind of castigation of the church for not having youthful enthusiasm. You know, return to your first love, the love that you had at first, and have that fiery enthusiasm that comes from when you're a new believer and when you were younger. And you know, the church just always seemed full of old people to me because I was so young. And I was reading a, a little while after uh, a book of reflections by a late 19th century holiness preacher from the, the States called G.D. Watson. And in this book of reflections, he said, we so often misread that command to return to your first love as about youthful enthusiasm, when actually it's about priority of commitment. Return to your first love, the love that you had before, when Jesus was first not that youthful enthusiasm. And I felt mildly rebuked and spiritually enlightened. So with this great theme that you've got, I was wanting to say, so if we're talking about first love as it relates to the Lord's supreme place in our life, you know, it goes without saying that worship is key and central to that expression. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, how do I find a way into what I'm going to say this evening? And providentially, I had been doing some work, or I have been doing some work on Romans 12. And I felt the Lord say, stick with Romans 12. So, have you got your Bibles there? Romans 12, and from verse 1. Paul says this, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is true worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, 
and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And Paul goes on, and we may refer to some of the other verses a, a little later too. But that's the, the essence of where I want us to, to focus our attention this evening. And it is, this whole passage is Paul's vision for the church. And it's one of the clearest visions he paints. And uh, from preaching class, Doug, you'll remember the importance of the number three. And so there are three points to what I'm going to say. And they are these, and we'll look at the passage in, in the light of these. First, that true worship is established in our personal relationship with God. Second, that true worship is embedded in our relationship with God's people. And third, true worship is expressed in action. Verse 1, this is true worship. Well, what Paul has been talking about is about our relationship with God. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. We're not used to this uh, sacrificial thing in worship. We don't do it. Where you take with you a ritual object and offer it as a sacrifice. The nearest we probably get is Harvest Festival, where we bring a can of beans and put them on the, the table at the front. I'm pretty sure that none of us have been into an act of worship where we have taken a lamb or a kid or a goat or a dove or a pigeon and as our act of worship taken the animal to sacrifice on the altar. We aren't used to this kind of imagery. Uh, remember one time I was uh, flying into Ben Gurion at uh, airport at Tel Aviv. And uh, you know how they come around with the newspapers for you to read. I had the choice of the Daily Mail or the Jerusalem Post. And I thought, well, the Jerusalem Post is a kind of interesting and exotic kind of read. So I was reading the Jerusalem Post. And in it, uh, there was an article by a rabbi. Uh, this was just at the time of the, uh, the outbreak of the Intifada in the early 1990s. And in this article, he said, when we retake Temple Mount and rebuild the temple, which of course would mean that the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque would be uh, removed, and they would be a cause of World War III, I'm sure. He said, as soon as the temple is rebuilt, we would have to reinstate animal sacrifice. I had never read anything like that. And it took, uh, took me by surprise and was something of a shock. But he went on to talk about how animal sacrifice is costly to the worshipper. And true worship has to have a cost attached to it. And as the life is offered in worship to God, as an expiation for sin, so the worship act happens. Now, we're not familiar with this stuff. Yeah, as 21st century Brits, it feels a bit awkward. It's uncomfortable. It's not nice. And Paul is certainly not saying that as Christians, we are some kind of animal to be given to God. But he does say, treat your bodies 
as a living sacrifice. Just as the body of the animal is sacrificed in worship, count your bodies as a sacrifice. Not killed on an altar, but a living sacrifice. A sacrifice that is an everyday reality. A sacrifice that means our bodies are put at God's disposal. A living sacrifice. Which is why we talk about you can't just be a Sunday Christian. You can't just turn up to worship on a Sunday and think that's the end of worship. Because true worship is about being a living sacrifice And as long as we are alive, we treat our bodies as though they were living sacrifices. So, from the moment we wake up in the morning to the moment we go to bed at night, whether we're at home or with our family or at work or at the shops or with friends or neighbors or in the community, all our moments are His and are part of the sacrifice which is true worship. And it's all wrapped up in verse 1. As much as I hate the phrase 24-7, because it's been so totally overdone, that's exactly what Paul is talking about. Now, he's using a first century image from Jewish worship to communicate what he's talking about. This is true worship. Where previously you could nip down to the temple and offer an animal and your worship would be over, Now, it's all the time because your bodies have become the animal body that is sacrificed. But a living sacrifice all day, every day. So, worship from what Paul is saying here in his vision of the church is far more than just singing songs and praying in a worship service. It's about a desire to live in relationship with God. And if you remember, my first point is the fact that true worship is established in our personal relationship with God as our bodies are offered as a living sacrifice. But this is only the beginning of it. Because after verse 1 comes verse 2. You see, we teach really technical stuff at college. So says Paul, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I'd love to say this was a biblical injunction for all of you to come to Spurgeon's College to have your minds renewed. And that is part of what God has for some people, though. But this is not what's on Paul's mind here. When he says, do not conform, do not uh, conform to the pattern of this world, He's wanting to say, in the world, there are forces that are at work within the culture in which you live that are strong and will mold you to become something. But you're not to conform to the pattern of the world. You are to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, in our context, uh, some of those really powerful forces probably the most powerful, consumerism. And it shapes who we are. A friend of mine wrote a book called Consumer Church on how we just consume church like we consume everything else because we've been shaped by the culture. Or we could talk about materialism. Or we could talk about secularism. Or any one of the other isms that sit with culture. Culture is a powerful thing. The uh, filmmaker and educator who now sits in the House of Lords, David Putnam, talks about the immense power of cinema and TV to mould a culture. And I think he's spot on. I think it's more powerful than we perhaps care to realise or even admit. But culture has always been like this. Uh, One of my heroes is a... Uh, another 19th century preacher, but he was a a Wesleyan preacher based in London called Hugh Price Hughes. He was a Welshman, you can tell by his name. And uh, Hughes was an editor of a paper as well as a pastor of a 2,000-member church. And in one of the editorials of his paper, 
He says, you know, British culture, it's far more shaped by the philosophy of Plato and Aristotle than it is by the divine love of the Apostle John or the justice of the prophet Isaiah. Now understand, late 19th century, uh, evangelical Christianity in Britain is at a high watermark. There have never been more evangelical believers in Britain than at the end of the 19th century. You've had almost 150 years of revival going on in the life of the churches. And still he says, you know, the wider culture of Britain, far more shaped by classical scholarship from Oxford and Cambridge of the ruling elite than it is by those biblical principles uh, from the Gospels and from the prophets. If we are to live our lives as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable, the question has to be, how do we bring our lives into conformity with Christ? And to do this, our hearts and minds and understanding needs to be changed and renewed. It's the connection that Paul's making. It means that we have to understand what God's will is. Then you will understand God's will, his good, perfect, and holy will. And the truth is there are no shortcuts to spiritual growth. We have to focus on a different center. Uh, We have to absorb and learn to absorb the heart and mind of God. That's what Paul's talking about in verse 2. He says it to the church at Ephesus as well. Then, for do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Foolishness not to. If you say you're a Christian believer. And this is why our understanding of God's truth from the Ten Commandments to God's love expressed in Christ, to the importance of truth, of justice, of mercy, of compassion, of forgiveness, why these things are so important. And if you ever wondered why sermons were significant in the life of the church, this is the reason. This is why Bible study, both privately and together, is important, because this is where we absorb the heart and mind and will of the Lord that can transform us. And this renewal of our mind is not just when we become Christians, it is a continual part of what we do. Not least because the values of the culture are strong and they pull us in a a different direction. Ever said, I just need to have a bit of retail therapy to cheer me up. And off we go to blue water or somewhere. Uh, Retail therapy actually was a a quote from the New York Times in uh, uh, 1985, the very first quote of retail therapy. But there is something about shopping that makes you feel good. You know, if it didn't, nobody would do it. (laughs) Week before Christmas, uh, Marion and I, and my wife, we, we were up in up in London, and we did uh, we, we did Oxford Street, we did a Liberty, and we went home without buying a thing. I felt so good. Then it was Pride. <laughs> you can't win. But the pull of materialism is strong. The pull of relativism. Another one of those isms in our culture is strong. Well, if it's true for you, ever said that? Well, is that actually a Christian sentiment? When actually we're dealing with truth and falsehood rather than what somebody thinks is true is therefore true because it's true for them? Or religion being all bad? Oh, the number of times. A college, I've spoken with students who say, we don't really want religion. We just want Jesus. Well, here's the deal. You have Jesus, you've got religion. They kind of go together. But there's a sense in which religion is toxic. Uh, And an understanding that religion is toxic. In the Daily Mail last week, there was a story about uh, how a physiotherapist from an East London NHS foundation was suspended for nine months for sharing her faith with a co-worker. 
She was then reinstated, but she had been suspended for nine months. Or we could talk about the sexualization of contemporary society. I've got a 16-year-old son. Uh, the conversations we have, because of what he is exposed to, that at 16, I didn't even know existed. You know, we live in a very different culture uh, to the one that many of us grew up in. Uh, much down to, to the internet, but also to the commercialization of sex. All of these things have a strong pull, which is why our minds need to be continually renewed. Our lives need to be brought into conformity with Christ. Which is probably the point at which to say something about services of worship, which is one part of worship. Many writers on the uh, missional life of the church talk about the formative nature of worship, of what we do when we gather together to sing and pray and sit under the Scriptures. And they say, you know, worship begins with a restorative function. Because when we come together to an act of worship, those of us who have fallen need forgiveness. And so the time for confession in a service of worship is really important so that people can clear their lines and clear their lives and be made clean and receive that word of absolution. You are forgiven. Those who have been captured need release. And if we have been captured by one of those isms of the culture of which we're a part, we need to know that gospel word be free so that our lives can be brought back into conformity with Christ. And those of us who have been wounded during the week, well, we need to find healing. Because sometimes when someone has wounded me by something they've said, you know how it kind of preoccupies the front part of your brain and you can't get past it? <laughs> and wounded souls need to be healed. And those of us who've been defeated need new courage so that we can stand on gospel truth. And those of us who come feeling weak need our strength renewed like the eagles. There is something about worship that is restorative. And it's really important as we are formed into the likeness of Christ. Uh, there's one writer, great name, Lofink. Uh, Lofink talks about the de-idolizing effect of worship. Most of us don't worship pagan idols, but the world around us is full of idolatry that will suck us in. And there's something about being in an act of worship that recenters us and de idolizes us from all of this rubbish that kind of accrues uh, in our everyday life. Uh, another writer talks about worship bringing a rhythm of adoration and action that as we come together to adore the one whose life who, who we've given our lives to being in his presence not only restores us but it then spurs us on to action in our life lived outside of that worship service so he says there is this rhythm of adoration and action so the sacrifice of praise is succeeded by a sacrifice of good works. Because are our bodies not living sacrifices all day and every day? I'm, I'm particularly taken by the idea, you know, you realize when we read Romans 12, there's another one of those kind of references to the, the church being the body, you know? Um, uh, one guy said, I'm really captured by this, this idea. He says, you know, the Holy Spirit is the breath of God. And like when the church gathers together for worship, it's like it breathes in 
And then when it scatters after its worship together, it's like it breathes out. And it's like this coming together to worship and then going out to serve Christ. It's like the church of God breathing. And it's in this breath that the breath of the Holy Spirit is at work restoring us from all of those things that have kind of ground us down, shaping us to be more like Jesus, then breathing us out in Holy Spirit breath and power into our daily lives. What a great image that kind of also sits in this passage uh, from this uh, Holy Spirit breathing, body, life, energy, acting. So worship services have an important function. But our worship services can get subverted by our consumerism. We like to sing the songs that we like. All the hymns that we like, because we all have our preferences, depending on our age and our musical taste, uh, which is not about good or bad, because there are good and bad old hymns, just that most of the bad ones have been shed years ago because nobody wants to sing them anymore. And there are good and bad modern ones. But you see how easy it would be getting to preference and personal taste and become consumers of worship rather than disciples offering a sacrifice of praise. Uh, worship is something we give to God, not something we get out of. Or something we get something out of primarily. Consciously then, we come into God's presence together. We come under the instruction of the Word of God as the acts of God are recounted. He forms us into His likeness and we are restored by grace and realigned to God so that the Holy Spirit can continue to form us into the likeness of Christ. I say this to every one of you, says the Apostle. And this is true worship. Established in our personal relationship with God. That was my first point. But it's the longest point, so you can breathe a sigh of relief. So true worship is established in the personal life of the believer. Second thing, true worship is embedded in our relationship with God's people. Christianity is not merely the exercise of an individual spirituality or personal growth. He calls us into Christian community to live and work together. So a couple of observations from this passage. Uh, verse 5, though we are many, we are one body in union with Christ. He makes us codependent. We can't be individual Christians. We're called to be a part of the body. He makes us codependent. And that picture of the body is vivid. When did you ever see a foot trotting, trotting off down the road by itself? You don't. When you see a hand busy writing a letter all on its own, unattached, you don't. The body has to function together. That's how it's designed. So God makes us into an interdependent body. To withdraw from the body, to separate ourselves from the body, is to cause ABH to the body of Christ. If we do not play our part the body of Christ is restricted or maimed. It's not whole. It's impaired. It's impoverished. It's impotent. It is not as God intended it to be. The body of Christ is handicapped if we do not function together. God is doing something as he fashions us into the body of Christ. And he builds community based on interdependence and relationship. And if there ever needs to be an answer to the question or the statement, you don't need to go to church to be a Christian, this is it. Yes, you do. Because that's the picture, the vision of the church that Paul has that sits behind this image of the body of Christ. So, worship is embedded in our relationships with one another within the body of Christ, and it is a codependent relationship. We need one another, and we can't escape from one another. 
But more than that, it's also an inclusive relationship. Verse 3, I say to every one of you, and verse 5, we are all joined to each other. Paul's not being creative here. Uh, He knows his Old Testament. Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity, for it's there the Lord bestows his blessing. It was always so. And Paul is being faithful to that biblical truth. And therefore, we have to work hard at unity. And living in community is never easy. Actually, living in community is really quite tough. But if relationships matter, then we have to be real. If our community is inclusive, that actually means we also have to include those who we wouldn't necessarily choose to be with. Church is full of people who, on a natural level, I probably wouldn't be close friends with. (laughs) But guess what? God wants us to be friends together and move beyond our personal preferences into building a community of substance that is rich and has depth and goes beyond those boundaries of, of personal taste. So it's about being real, it's about being inclusive of even people we wouldn't naturally gravitate towards, should we say. And it's more than just a cursory hello. This is an organic unity. We are part of the same body. We can't walk away from one another. (laughs) So he says in verse 9, which is outside the first eight verses we, we read, love must be completely sincere. It goes to our motive intention of being in community of sincerity. Verse 10, love one another warmly. Show, be eager and show respect to one another. Verse 10. Do everything possible on your part to live in peace with everybody. Verse 18. You can see this is a theme he's learned he has to keep coming back to because this stuff doesn't come naturally to us. But it's part of that working at being a codependent and inclusive community. And it's a powerful idea. And this is true worship. Embedded in our relationship with God's people. What we do together. Third thing. True worship is expressed in action. Verse 6. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. What God has done on the inside has to be worked out on the outside. Therefore, God empowers us, gifts us to do His will, according to the grace at work within us. And interesting, when you look at the gifts that He outlines here, they aren't necessarily the ones that you expect. When you talk about God's gifts, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the grace gifts, most often we will look to Corinthians and there are all those kind of super spiritual, super spiritually powerful gifts. And the the biblical commentators will say, actually, no, when when Paul's writing to Corinthians, he's kind of using their language. Uh, If you want Paul's preferred list, look at Romans. There are good reasons for that, and the the Bible scholars in the church will be able to tell you why. Uh, But the the list of gifts he has, if your gift is prophesying, speaking God's message, according to the faith we have, do it. Prophesy. Verse 7, if your gift is serving, what do you need to do? You need to get on and serve. Also, verse 7, if your gift is teaching, what do you need to do? Get on and teach. Uh, verse 8, if your gift is encouraging others, what do you need to do? Uh, well, you just need to do it. Uh, also, in verse 8, if your gift is giving, what do you need to do? Give generously. Notice generously came in there. Um, If your gift is leadership, still verse 8, do it, and do it diligently. Work hard at it. If your gift is showing mercy, uh, one translation uses the word kindness there. I like the word kind. I think it's a four-letter word Christians should use. 
I think kindness is much underrated in the world. When someone's kind to you, do you not feel better? Do you not feel as though you've kind of been lifted up? There is a, there is a lack of kindness. Oh, that more of God's people would have the spiritual gift of kindness. Boy, would that transform the world. <laughs> 